Now, no parent sets out to traumatize a child. The problem is that stress, especially traumatic stress, sculpts the brain. Stress can set off a ripple of hormonal changes that permanently wire a child's brain to cope with a malevolent world. The only buffer the children have against traumatic stress is a parent, is that attachment relationship. Uh, any of you, and I think that goes for most of you, who've been around small children, uh, are very aware that babies come into the world, uh, as we say, dysregulated, right? That's, the, uh, uh, that's what it's called. If only I had known that when my children were born. Oh, he's just dysregulated. That's the problem. <laughs> Rather than, I haven't had any sleep for days. Uh, no, he's just dysregulated. And what is a parent meant to do with a dysregulated little tiny baby? We're meant to repair that dysregulated state. Right? That's the, these are the, the terms used in the attachment field. And, uh, and when we... Uh, do a good repair, we have a state of attunement. And what does that mean on a practical level? It's an oxytocin moment. And the key is that in that moment of attunement, right? so you've, you've changed the diaper, you fed the baby, you walked 100 miles, right? you've rocked, uh, you've done some more, you know, you've played with, you've done all the things that we do as parents. And then that little body relaxes and nestles into your body. And you feel the warmth and the relaxation of the baby's body. And your body relaxes. And those are the delicious moments that fuel you for the next moment of dysregulation, which could be only five minutes away. <laughs> <laughs> It could be very soon, might be a few hours, but it might only be five. And so this, this cycle, repeated over and over again, is a buffer against stress. Now, the repeated experiences eventually sculpt a nervous system that expects safety or it expects danger or it expects one or the other, and you never know which. Uh, this, by the way, is a very, very simple model of autonomic arousal that uh, I teach to clients, to parents, to, you know, I can teach it to a 10-year-old, I can teach it to a 70-year-old. And basically, the model says we're born with the capacity for high activation that allows us to leap tall buildings at a single bound, to flee, to fight, to drop to the ground. Um, we're also born with the capacity for very low activation, uh, as in a medically induced coma or hypothermia. Right? That low activation allows us to exist. Uh, it's called an energy-conserving state. Uh, that gives us time to heal. Now, hopefully, we are neither recovering from some catastrophic event or running for our lives. Uh, and when we're in our, a normal, reasonably safe kind of world, we're in what Dan Siegel calls the window of tolerance. It is, and then, by the way, that doesn't refer to some Buddha-like calm, right? The idea is not to become the Dalai Lama. The, the goal is actually to be, have a window of tolerance that is wide enough and resilient enough that we can tolerate intense emotions and we can tolerate boredom and we can tolerate fatigue. I remember a lot of those early child-rearing months uh, as consisting of a lot of fatigue and a lot of boredom, right? as well as those moments when 
a very, very dysregulated baby was dysregulating a very young mother. Uh, so the idea is that our window of tolerance allows us to have our autonomic arousal kind of fluctuate with the needs of the day. And we feel safe as long as it's wide enough. Now, how do you get this beautiful, flexible window of tolerance? Uh, you get it from your parents. So that when you are very, very distressed, when you're sad, when you're tired, when you've been sick, someone picks you up, holds you, uh, distracts you, reassures you, and your little nervous system uh, re-regulates into that window of tolerance state. Okay? As you know, this takes a very wide window of tolerance in the parent because it's, it's a lot of a lot of patience, a lot of energy to over and over and over again uh, create this window of tolerance optimally aroused state. When we are frightening, and you know, my, my children are now 41 and 43, and I have grandchildren, and uh, my 40-year-old sons, uh, as Louise and I were talking about, you know, the beautiful thing about nonviolent parenting is that uh, you have a relationship with your kids as they grow even into their adult years. The downside of that is they are old enough then to tell you everything you did wrong as a parent. <laughs> <laughs> and because you have such wonderful communication, they're perfectly happy to tell you. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and some of the things they've shared with me uh, are that you, they, well, they have said several times, you know, you had so much patience until you didn't. Right? <laughs> and then uh, I would have these... Uh, really unexpected, alarming outbursts of anger. And they said, you know, what we would take away was not the weeks and months of patience, but the moment that you lost it. That's what we would remember. So when we are frightening, right, again, whether it is because we ourselves come from a culture in which frightening a child is considered good parenting, whether we're young parents and we lose it sometimes, as all parents do, uh, whether our own trauma uh, activates flight fight behavior toward the child, whatever it is, frightening parenting does not allow the window of tolerance to develop. Uh, again, intermit being intermittently frightening is not going to have a huge effect. But when day in, day out, uh, children feel afraid instead of safe, the window of tolerance can't develop. The child either has to stay in a heightened state of alarm, uh, adrenaline pumping, on guard, jacked up, uh, ready to flee, ready to fight, or a child becomes more checked out. This is the, the cortisol response. Uh, numb uh, children can go into that state of, you know, whatever, I don't care anymore. Uh, I'm just going through the motions. Uh, I don't have to tell you that the children who come to the attention of their teachers and mental health professionals tend to be this group. Uh, I'm a trainer for the state of Massachusetts Department of Mental Health uh, Child and Adolescent Division, so I train staff who work in adolescent and child residential programs. Those programs are full uh, of these kids, right? These are the kids who are depressed, but they're not making any trouble. Now, the experience of threat whether it's what Sakvitni calls a set of enduring conditions, right? So some children grow up in enduring conditions of fear. 
due to neighborhood violence, domestic violence, uh, or emotional, physical, or sexual abuse in the home. Okay. For some children, there are multiple events. I've only met in 33 years. Uh, I have met only one adult who had a single traumatic experience in childhood. They seem to come in clusters. So we are going to use the triune brain model of Paul McLean because it's so user friendly. Again, we can teach children, adolescents, parents, uh, individuals. The triune brain model very kindly and courteously reduces the brain to just three regions, making it much easier to remember. So the first part of the brain to come online at, at birth, the part of the brain that is most active in the newborn baby, is the reptilian brain, right? Because one of the most important tasks for a newborn to breathe, to have a regular heart rate, to have all those little reflexes and instincts intact. Um, around two and a half months, three months, uh, as you probably, most of you know, little babies become social. Uh, they start to wiggle and giggle and smile from ear to ear uh, when you go to pick them up. Uh, and again, you know, that's an oxytocin moment. Uh, I remember my, my youngest son uh, used to wake up between 4.30 and 5.30, and I'm not a morning person. And it was his big smile and all that wiggling and giggling that made it possible for me to smile back and think this is just a beautiful moment rather than it's 4.30 in the morning. Well, that's the limbic system developing. So the third part of the brain is the limbic system which controls uh, and remembers our emotional experience and also our relational experience. And interestingly enough, side by side, the limbic system also responds to threat. Isn't that really interesting? That the limbic system is this repository of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and uh, in our emotional and somatosensory experience. Now, and by the way, the limbic system is also implicated in empathy. Uh, this is Bruce Perry's uh, idea that it uh, limbic system development in the first year of childhood is what allows us to have empathy at later ages and stages. So very, very, very important. Uh, uh, the limbic system, by the way, stops growing at 13. So we have a little, we have a window of opportunity of 13 years to elaborate a limbic system that's going to have a huge influence on our emotional lives for the remaining decades. Now, the frontal cortex grows very, very slowly through childhood, has a little growth spurt around age two when kids are acquiring language. Uh, but then it grows slowly and steadily until uh, kids are around 12 to 13 when we get this huge growth spurt that takes children into adolescence. And here's what happens. No, oh, and I should add, the uh, developmentally, what's supposed to happen is as we mature, the frontal cortex more and more and more has the ability to intelligently manage our emotions and our actions. So if the reptilian brain is about action and the uh, limbic system is about emotion, it is our frontal lobes that tell us how to use our emotions and actions wisely. And you, we all know that uh, we humans can use emotions and actions uh, in healthy and unhealthy ways. What happens to this brain when the child is exposed to threat? 
what happens is the threat is received by the thalamus, which is our gateway for sensory information. And that information is relayed to the amygdala. So it's the, all information pertaining to threat goes to the amygdala because the amygdala is the smoke and fire alarm system, as Louise said. The frontal cortex shuts down because you don't want to be standing around thinking when your life is at risk, right? You want to be able to move, right? You've got to move quickly and instinctively uh, rather than engage in a slow thinking process. Very, very important. Now, this sequence occurs not only when children are hurt as in abuse, but it also occurs in anticipation, right? You hear a footstep, you hear a car door, you hear a voice, right? It's a particular day of the week, it's a particular time of day. Uh, you hear a change in the voice or body language of your other parent that signals something bad is going to happen. And whether that something bad happens or not, uh, our bodies go through this same cycle. So imagine that you're a little kid and your frontal lobes are shutting down every time you hear an unexpected noise, uh, every time, think about a school setting, every time there's pushing and shoving in the hallways, uh, your amygdala sounds the alarm, your frontal lobes shut down, and now you have to go to your next class. How well are you going to be able to do in school? Um, another important part of the limbic system is what's called the hippocampus. Notice how it kind of folds around the amygdala. And what does the hippocampus do? Hippoc the hippocampus is meant to process the memories. You know, every day your hippocampus is working hard Processing at a nonverbal level everything that happens. Right? So before I can remember, right? So I'm going to have a memory of this conference, right? And before this narrative forms, my hippocampus will have processed this whole experience at a nonverbal level. So think about children and adults who have trouble putting words to their experience who have trouble remembering how something happened. Well, you know, all I remember is when he hit me, right? right? There isn't uh, an ability, it's hard to remember how one thing led to another, led to another. That's, that's the sign of a hippocampus that can't do its work because the hippocampus also shuts down when we're under threat. So now we've been threatened. Our frontal lobes are shut down so we can't think. The hippocampus is compromised uh, so we can't really put together why something happened. And the amygdala is now even more sensitive to any cue, right? Can you see the vicious circle that starts to develop? All in the service of surviving threat. Now, all of us, but particularly children, remember traumatic events with our emotions and our bodies. We think this actually goes back to the uh, cave men and women. Uh, because just think, if you're a cave man, woman, or child, it's much, much safer to remember danger or sense danger with your body than to have to think, let's see, what direction did the mountain lion come from yesterday? Right? What you want is before you're even aware of some movement in the grass, right? you want your body to start to prepare. Now, if we remember trauma with our feelings and our bodies, we don't know that we're remembering. 
And as Dan Siegel says, these nonverbal states do not carry with them the internal sensation that something is being recalled. We act, feel, and imagine without recognition of the influence of past experience on our present reality. Now, developmental trauma then is a term that doesn't describe events. It describes a living legacy of a series of events or a set of conditions. Right? Because an event, no matter how traumatic, is just an event. The living legacy are the symptoms that that traumatic event leaves behind. Right? For many uh, individuals, it's a legacy that is often misunderstood as depression. Um, sometimes understood as PTSD. You know, um, one of the symptoms we often forget uh, as a, a PTSD symptom is a sense of a foreshortened future. We lose a sense of having a future, right? A classic symptom of PTSD, right? Uh, and so no wonder um, traumatized individuals feel hopeless because if you don't have a sense, uh, in a future that you can believe in, that you can wait for, hope for, uh, it's much easier to go into trauma-related hopelessness. Uh, shame and self-loathing. Um, all kinds of symptoms we associate with trauma, like nightmares, flashbacks, startle responses, but also anxiety disorders. Uh, chronic pain has been associated with trauma. Substance abuse, eating disorders, suicidality, and uh, in children, conduct disorders, right? Oppositional, defiant disorder, uh, borderline personality disorder in adults. So this is the living legacy of trauma. And uh, you'll see uh, in the, at the bookstore at lunch, uh, I've brought some of my psychoeducational flip charts uh, it's a publication that I developed to educate uh, clients about their trauma symptoms so that they can be uh, experts as well. Uh, and so this diagram is the first diagram in the flip chart uh, in a simplified client-friendly version. And when I show the client this diagram, uh, usually, it's a wonderful thing just to show the diagram uh, because most traumatized individuals have no idea that what they consider their defectiveness is actually uh, all this living legacy of trauma. And so oftentimes there's this kind of oh, awe and wonder uh, or they say, wow, can I just tell you the ones I don't have? That would be so much quicker. Um, and then I ask a very important question. I say, how did the depression help you to survive? And you know, they, they never seem shocked by the question. The, and, the, and the answer comes very quickly. Oh, the depression, it's like a buffer. It's like a cocoon. You can kind of hide in it. How about the irritability? How did irritability help you to survive? 90% of the hundreds of people to whom I've asked that question say, the irritability helps me to push people away. Right? How about loss of interest? Well, then they can take everything away from me, and it doesn't matter because I don't care anymore anyway. Uh, how about numbing? Then I don't have to feel anything. And that's as far as I have to go because I've already made the point this living legacy, these symptoms, represent how this individual survived. These are the survival strategies, now the symptoms. Okay? Think about it. How does hopelessness help us to survive in a traumatic situation? Loss of a sense of a future. 
Can you see if you're a prisoner of war, which children are, right? Uh, isn't it easier if you just exist and you don't worry about a future, right? Just day by day, right? All of these symptoms represent uh, valiant attempts at surviving. The autonomic nervous system uh, adapts not to a safe world, but to a threatening world. Little time, I call it a window of tolerance the size of a toothpick. You know, it's very hard to be a parent if your window of tolerance is the size of a toothpick. Right? Um, you will see clients with a whole uh, collection of hyperarousal related symptoms, which again, in my mind, tells a story. Ah, to survive, this person had to be on his or her guard, had to be ready to fight, had to be ready to run. All right, so you see impulsivity, hypervigilance, mistrust, uh, resistance to the treatment that he or she is begging for, uh, all kinds of fear and uh, panic symptoms, flashbacks, nightmares, but also intrusive feelings. Sudden, intrusive feelings of rage, fear, uh, sadness, uh, and self-destructive, suicidal, and addictive behavior. We also see uh, individuals with a constellation of hypoarousal symptoms. Um, numb, feeling empty or dead. Um, thinking very, very, you know, this... Uh, Hyperarousal causes racing thoughts. Hypoarousal makes you feel like you're thinking through molasses. Like, oh, I don't know. Um, hypoarousal is associated with shame, despair, self-loathing, and a tendency to get re-victimized because you don't have the energy to fight. You don't have the sense uh, that you can say no. Right? And um, um, many battered wives uh, become, uh, uh, develop this state because it's safer in the battering situation to be in that hypoarousal state. In fact, when I was consulting to a, uh, a uh, shelter program for, uh, uh, for women who've been uh, um, battered, uh, the women said, our, we were down here until the police came, and then we'd be up here, and the police would think we were as much at fault as our husbands, because we could finally get angry once the police came. The living legacy includes implicit emotional memories, despair, desperation, Feeling chronically unsafe of the world in the world, uh, feeling chronically afraid of people, um, having this sense that someone's out to get you, even though you know that's not true. Shame, despair, feeling paralyzed. Again, often when when individuals report these feelings, we assume their emotional responses to current experience. But if sometimes these are actually emotional memories. And notice on this list, behavioral responses, angry, outbursts, aggressive behavior. Uh, I remember a former client of mine who is patient beyond words with her son, who at this time was about eight. Uh, and she came in saying, you know, I'm just ready to strangle my boyfriend, my son, or both. Uh, and I said, "Ah, oh, that's so interesting. And what is it they're doing that's uh, causing you to want to strangle them? She said, they're playing at the dinner table. <laughs> they're, they're, they're playing these games. You know, one will put a, uh, a fork of mashed potato on the other one's plate, and then uh, the other will do it. Uh, and I said, okay, when you were a kid, 
what would have happened if you had done that at the dinner table? And she said, we would have been beaten. Okay. So in that moment that her son and her boyfriend were having this, uh, this guy moment, you know, so I don't think, I don't think uh, little girls and uh, female parent figures would enjoy the mashed potato game as much as little boys. Uh, and right in that moment of mutuality, probably an oxytocin moment for the son and the boyfriend, uh, my client was feeling ready to beat both of them as she had been beaten as a kid for, for fooling around, right? So past and present become confused. As Dan Siegel says, when the images and sensations of experience remain in implicit only form, they remain in unassembled neural disarray, not tagged as representations from the past. Such implicit only memories continue to shape the subjective feeling we have of our here and now realities, the sense of who we are moment to moment. Now, another kind of implicit memory is the procedural memory system. And that's our memory system for habit, action, reaction, skills. So if you ride a bike, if you work out at the gym, if you uh, drive a car, you're engaging in procedural learning. Uh, when you can change a diaper in your sleep, that's procedural learning. Uh, and many of these skills are things that we can uh, abandon for a period of time, you know, not ride a bike for years. Uh, you get back on a bike and your body still remembers how to do it. Uh, procedural learning also is how we learn social behavior. Whether you look people in the eye and extend your hand, whether you look down at the floor as a gesture of respect, all of that is procedural learning. So trauma-related procedural learning often dominates both adults and children who have been abused. Difficulty making eye contact. Would you want to make eye contact if every time you looked into your parents' eyes, the response you got was, what are you staring at? Right? Pretty soon, you would learn to avoid making eye contact, right? No way am I making eye contact. Putting feelings into words, right? What if you get punished for putting feelings into words? You're going to procedurally learn not to uh, put words and feelings together. Uh, what I call default settings, right? Most of us these days, uh, if we work with computers, are familiar with default settings, right? When your computer does the old thing uh, because it uh, has forgotten that you have a new printer or a new uh, you know, email server. In trauma, automatic default settings uh, are very much a survival response. So you'll see tendencies uh, to automatic self-blame, right? Uh, and so it's anything, right? If, if somebody, I remember actually being on a subway and, it, and accidentally bumping somebody. I was the uh, perpetrator, so to speak. But the person I bumped was, oh, I'm sorry. Right? Because that's a default setting. Um, automatic anger responses, right? A lot of uh, violent parenting comes because we have angry default settings, right? You feel vulnerable, you get angry. You feel anxious, you get angry. You feel sad, you get angry. Behavioral responses, isolating and withdrawing, acting out, uh, help-seeking, avoiding help at all costs, uh, emotional expression, all the patterns of emotional expression can be procedural memory, as well as interpersonal patterns. And so that also becomes a challenge because trauma, you know, all development leaves us with procedural default settings. 
But if they're associated with trauma, they have a life or death intensity. Right? It isn't just, I prefer to be alone. It's, I don't feel safe unless I'm alone. Now, attachment experiences leave us with what attachment researchers call expectancies. Okay? Even newborn babies learn expectancies. Uh, and you see it, you know, the baby hears your voice and turns toward it, right? At an older age, the baby sees you, hears your voice, and the arms come up. These are not cognitive. These come be well before language. And they reflect the body prepare, preparing for what is going to happen next. And that's how we work. That's how the human mind and body work. An activity that has previously been adapted is likely to recur because the brain functions automatically but probabilistically to produce the same behavior in similar circumstances. Now, just to make it even more complicated, the brain, the brains of all of us, have a negativity bias. Can you believe it? This is, this is uh, something to be so aware of. And I actually did, I thought trauma was the cause of the negativity bias. And then doing some research in the last month, I suddenly discovered, no, the brains of all human beings have a negativity bias. We are biased to perceive the negative before the positive. We encode negative memories faster than we encode positive memories. Isn't that depressing? By the way, speaking of the negativity bias, right? It takes more work to encode a positive memory than a negative memory. Now, Hamlin observed that the negativity bias is present as early as six months of age. Okay? So in that crucial first year. On top of that, it's the left brain that has a positivity bias. Children are not left brain dominant or even equal, right, until 12 and up. So the negativity bias is safer. Um, but again, uh, it means that we don't remember the good things that have happened to the extent we remember the bad things. Now, the assumptions of a neurobiologically formed trauma model are that trauma is going to leave behind a kind of indelible procedural learning because it's associated with life or death. The body develops habits of self-protectiveness so that we automatically default to fight, flight, freeze, submit, or cry for help responses. And we act on the basis of those without any clear sense of why we're doing it. Uh, this has really uh, been, this whole idea has helped to change the climate in the uh, adolescent and child programs in Massachusetts as the staff are learning that, that the children who act out are not doing so intentionally, okay? uh, that they are responding to their nervous systems and to their bodies. And one of the biggest problems, because developmental trauma is in interpersonal, is that as a result, human beings trigger the sense of threat rather than the sense of safety. And that's huge. I mean, imagine um, looking around this room. Like right this minute, I'm looking around this room, and I am sensing safety. I, and I'm not getting a saber-toothed tiger feeling uh, from this group. But what if I were? Right? What if my body were biased? to see all of you as critical, as reactive, as likely uh, to uh, hit me, as to shame me. 
the emotions, the body sensations, the impulses that are triggered by traumatic reminders. Now, by the way, what's a traumatic a reminder? Uh, it isn't just, for instance, uh, it, we're all perfectly familiar with this idea that if children are abused by a male parent, they're going to be afraid of men. But traumatic reminders include everything associated with the context in which abuse occurs. So for anyone traumatized in the context of home, family, community, it means that everyday life is going to be filled with traumatic reminders. Right? Something as simple as a living room, a kitchen, a bathroom, right? a school, uh, a time of year, a set of weather conditions. And so all those traumatic reminders signal the amygdala to say, uh-oh, red alert, it's not safe here. And so past and present become confused. <laughs> and that's part of what happens in child abuse. In the moment a child is crying and the parent is triggered not to production of oxytocin, but to production of adrenaline, that baby feels like the enemy rather than a vulnerable creature needing help. So having a trauma lens is crucial, isn't it? Right? So um, I'm here because, uh, because Louise uh, wanted you all to uh, have an understand -a scope for looking at trauma. Right? Again, whether we're parents, whether we are survivors of abuse and neglect ourselves, whether we're teachers, whether we're staff, we need to have that trauma lens. Bruce Perry uh, says we have to learn to think from the bottom up. He says the hardest parts of the brain to change are the lower levels. Cognitive processing, by the way, cognitive processing is the basis of all psychotherapy models, from uh, Freudian psychoanalysis to cognitive behavioral work. Um, cognitive process is the basis for most of our models for working with other human beings. He says, well, it works when there's mature cortical and limbic development, but not with early neglect and trauma. He says this is the case because the brain's biological imperative is the stress response. Right? The brain doesn't care whether we're happy, whether we have bliss, as Louise said. The brain cares that we're alive and, uh, and safe. Through repetition, Bruce Perry says, strong trauma-related synaptic connections develop that need very infrequent re reactivation to maintain them. And because sensory input is perceived at lower levels of the brain, by the time the input gets to cortical levels, uh, it's too late. Right? And that's the whole basis for the, uh, is it a stick or a snake uh, saying, right? So you see something thin and brown on the hiking trail, right? And your body immediately assume snake right? until your cortical levels say, don't worry, that's just a stick. So Bruce Perry has a recipe for trauma treatment. And as I thought about it, as I was preparing for this talk, I, I realized that it really applies to nonviolent parenting models, uh, to all kinds of of models that have to do with interpersonal and social change. He says we need trauma treatments that are relational. They create safety. That are relevant, meaning developmentally matched, not at this level when what the child or adult needs is at this level. Um, 
our treatments should be repetitive, right? We should be able to procedurally learn them. They can't be so complicated that we have to look at the recipe, right? We have to be able to memorize them, so to speak. They have to be rewarding, right? They have to be pleasurable. Who wants to do it over and over and over again if it isn't pleasurable? Um, it has to be rhythmic. Um, and it has to be respectful, right? And rhythmic means, for example, with young children, but even with adults, I call this the good night moon technique, right? Where, where, and I, and I'm, you know, this is, I use the good night moon technique with 50 year olds, right? Where I say the same words in the same tone, week after week after week, right? Because the, that, those rhythms help us to feel safe, right? Um, and last but not least, of course, we have to have treatments that are respectful. Now, here, here are the subtleties, because of course I can say, well, of course I have relational, relevant, repetitive, rewarding, rhythmic, and respectful treatments. But he says, relational doesn't just mean what feels relational to us. It has to feel relational to the other person, right? It has to enhance the other's feeling of safety, uh, the other's feeling that we get it. Otherwise, it isn't relational, right? So relational is about what we induce in the other person, not so much how we behave. Uh, relevant, uh, talking about what happened, uh, is not always re is certainly not relevant for young children, but may not be relevant to adults uh, if talking about what happened uh, dysregulates the nervous system and is experienced as threat. Talking about what happened isn't going to be relevant if the major problems are implicit body and emotional memories. What's rewarding? An intervention that's regulated and feels good even if it doesn't make sense to us. Um, rhythmic, right? For, you know, with kids, we can talk about the rhythms of play. With adults, the, the rhythms of interaction as well as words and tone. And Respectful uh, doesn't just mean, again, the classic uh, helper respectful behavior, but also respecting the symptoms, respecting the good person underneath the difficult behavior. I just want to acknowledge the role of sensory motor psychotherapy in what I do, and I'm happy to say that LA is actually one of the uh, cities where sensory motor training is now, I think, in its eighth or ninth generation. Um, I discovered sensory motor psychotherapy when Betzel van der Kolk brought Pat Ogden, its founder, to the trauma center to speak at the annual conference probably 12, 13 years ago. And what I immediately appealed to me was that sensory motor psychotherapy was a talking therapy that also employs the body and the nonverbal. And so it is a way to get at those aspects of trauma below the story, okay? uh, at the nervous system, body, and emotional levels. Now, to treat trauma, whether we're helping parents to treat their own trauma, whether we're helping clients, we have to reverse the frontal lobe inhibition. As Joseph Ledoux says, treatment of pathologic fear may require that the patient learn to increase activity in the prefrontal region so that the amygdala is less free to express fear. Isn't this a, what a cool evolutionary development. Right? If the mindful and thinking brain is online, the amygdala assume, assumes everything's fine. Right? Isn't that wild? 
Uh, how do we do that? Uh, we do that by providing accurate information to people about their symptoms. That's what the flip chart was developed to do. Evoking curiosity, assuming a positive attempt to the most vicious or confusing or bizarre actions and reactions. Changing people's relationship to the trauma symptoms so that they feel like symptoms rather than like truths. All right, so in the moment that my client was ready to strangle her son and boyfriend, in that moment her body believed it was dangerous for two uh, family members to fool around at the dinner table. Her body believed that. We had to change her relationship to those alarm signals so that she could enjoy seeing her son and her boyfriend form such a beautiful relationship. Using mindfulness, right? Dan Siegel has helped us to bring mindfulness into the psychotherapy world. Because what does mindfulness do? It downregulates the amygdala, right? Uh, it has a direct impact on the amygdala. When we help people to make sense of their actions and reactions, they feel less ashamed. When they begin to see patterns of triggering, they don't feel as crazy. So when my very nonviolent client wanted to kill her son and boyfriend, she felt crazy. Like, what's happening to me? I don't do anger. Right? That's not who I am. Right? So when we understand the, the whole cause effect of triggers and uh, implicit memories and autonomic responses, uh, we feel saner. We can model uh, curiosity and compassion so that others can internalize it. One of the most important goals is to help people recognize the role of triggering. Uh, and here's an example. This is, these are some kid examples. Um, an eight-year-old boy, these are actually real examples from, uh, from colleagues. Uh, an eight-year-old boy. Um, uh, reports being sent to detention because he keeps leaving the classroom without permission, just getting up and running. All right? So uh, uh, the therapist asks, what were you feeling when you left the classroom? Like something, something must have, you must have had a good reason. Now every conversation starts out with, you must have had a good reason for leaving the classroom. What were you feeling? Right? I wanted to get out of there. Wow. So what triggered you? We can teach that word to kids. Okay. Uh, the teacher had this really mean look, and then she laughed at me. Uh-huh. So people who look mean really scare you, huh? Yeah, but I shouldn't have left because I just got in more trouble. And then we can rehearse new options. Well, you know what? Let's you and me figure out what you can do when people who look mean trigger you in school. Right? So, you know, um, for kids, a straight face is, looks mean. Laughing means somebody is laughing at you. Right? Um, Feldenkrais says, in order to do what you want, you have to know what you're doing. Right? And that's the importance of uh, both mindful noticing and seeing these relationships between triggers and reactions. So here's a 10-year-old girl uh, who, uh, this is a 10-year-old girl with a, uh, a long history in the foster care system adopted into a family. Uh, and, uh, and she's uh, had a huge tantrum in therapy. Wow, something must have triggered you, huh? 
I don't know. I don't remember. You know, kids always say, I don't know. You notice? Well, on the way to therapy, what were you feeling? Well, I wanted to go sort of. It was bugging me. I got freaked out, I guess. Uh Uh-huh. Well, lots of things about therapy are triggering. Yeah, I guess. But I want to have somebody to talk to. Well, you know, some kids who've been in foster care decide never, ever, 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 ever to talk to anyone ever again. And she says, no, it's not like that. It's more like the feelings are too strong. Yes, feelings are strong and scary, aren't they? Yes, so I try to stop feeling them, but it's too late. And then what happens? Then I don't know. I don't remember what happens after that. You know, when we break it down for kids, often they actually don't remember their quote-unquote oppositional behavior. Uh, Well, you know, some kids learn to go away far, far inside when their feelings get big, and especially if grown-ups make it worse. Uh, And she says, I don't know, it just happens, and then people get mad at me. Not understanding. So you need people to know how strong your feelings get so they can help you take a little bit of feeling out one at a time. Uh, And she says, yeah, because I really need to talk to somebody. So as we're helping her to notice these relationships, um, she is learning to mindfully observe at a 10-year-old level. Uh, Memorize the word notice. That's the word that invites people to be mindful rather than reactive or analytic. Be curious. Those are my favorite words. Notice. Be curious. Try to appreciate rather than fix. So when people come in with symptoms, crises, decisions, right? I can't handle this anymore. I give up. We need to restrain the impulse to fix in favor of getting curious, right? With our children, with our clients, uh, right? We gotta be curious about the triggers, we gotta be curious at the reaction. We have to validate. Well, just be curious. How could giving up have helped you to survive? And then the next steps become self-evident. So I just want to end, uh, because I see, I can't see, there's two different clocks here. One says I have five minutes, and one says I have zero. Uh, (laughs) uh, And so I'm not sure which to listen to. Um, I'm going to assume, I'll tell you what, I'll assume in between. How's that? Um, So let me go to, just to say a few words uh, about uh, nonviolent, consequences and limits for traumatized children. Remember that even nonviolent boundary setting is going to be experienced by traumatized children as triggering. So will your interest and curiosity. So will your affection. Because their frontal lobes keep shutting down, they're not going to remember what you discussed, what you collaborated on. They're not going to remember uh, the boundary. And we have to expect that our efforts to help are going to get misinterpreted. If you've never known consistent nonviolent parenting, um, your body is always prepared for violence. Now, Let me just end with a few words about the social engagement system. Uh, Little babies are, uh, as you know, uh, have this amazing social engagement system. In the brain, the social engagement system controls the muscles of the eyes and eyelids, uh, the facial uh, expression and smiling muscles, the larynx for voice, the middle ear for listening, and the heart. 
Isn't that great? And the, all of us naturally engage the social engagement system with babies, small children, and animals, right? And that's, it's the social engagement system that makes you go, oh, he's so cute. How old is he? Right? And we also always cock our heads. You know, you never say, he's so cute, right? You go, oh, he's so cute, right? That's the social engagement system. The social engagement system is inhibited under threat. That means that traumatized parents don't have full use of the social engagement system. Traumatized kids don't have full use of the social engagement system. If we want to help parents and kids, we have to make use of our social engagement systems. We have to deliberately use these muscles Right? That help, right? Imagine, well, you know, when you set a boundary with a kid, or if you sit down to have a discussion about something that's happened, and you cock your head, you're non-threatening, right? Use your facial expressions, right? Think this is a, what's called co-regulation, right? These are these precious oxytocin moments when the baby's social engagement system and the mother's social engagement system are in communication and, uh, and we feel that shared joy in connection. Use your voice. Experiment with facial expression, energy, empathy versus challenge, uh, how much we verbally process and how much we non-verbally process. So that we're actually teaching people through our bodies and our nervous systems and our facial expressions uh, what we want them to understand. Uh, Dan Hughes says it so very well. He says the primary therapeutic attitude that needs to be demonstrated throughout a session is one of playfulness acceptance, curiosity, and empathy. Um, playful interactions focused on positive affective experiences are never forgotten. Shame is always met with empathy, followed by curiosity. All communication is embodied within the nonverbal. All resistance is met with playfulness, acceptance, curiosity and empathy, rather than being confronted. Uh, thank you all so much. It's such a pleasure to be with you today. Hello. Thank you, Janina. I apologize.